Foundation is so important, and whether you're talking about an educational foundation, um, the education you get early on really sets the tone for uh, the rest of your life. Um, there's a funny story. I was talking with Jeff, and he was talking about a missionary that uh, had gotten private tutoring with this person and uh, learned how to speak the language with this person. And then later on, as he was trying to use this language, found out that the person who was teaching him had a stutter. So he learned all these words <laughs> the wrong way. He didn't have a good foundation for learning the language because this, this person was a bad foundation. Uh, but obviously, there's, there's educational, there's financial. Uh, just getting, understanding how to use money and how to spend it wisely, and getting that foundation is gonna help you in life as well. And of course, we could also talk about a structural foundation and uh, how important that is. And, and I don't need to give you a lot of examples about how important a foundation is. And foundations are important, but of course you can't live on a foundation. Right? If you put a foundation down on land, people are expecting that you're not just going to set up some patio chairs and live on that foundation, that you're going to build up from there. And the stronger the foundation, the bigger and the better the house that can go on that foundation and live. And if you're a Christian, you've been building at that found, you've been building on that foundation for the rest, you know, your whole life. Some of you are young and you're just starting off. And, and what we're trying to do as a church is to help your parents build that foundation so that you have something that can sustain your faith and something that can help build what is going to be your walk with God for the rest of your life. And church, that's a challenge to you to make sure that you're investing in that, that, that the young people that are here in this church are, are looking at you as an example and that remembering the joy that you have in the Lord, the um, victory uh, over sin, that when they come, that they find joyful people, that they find people that are not trying to be perfect, that we are flawed, but when, we're, when we make errors, when we sin, that we confess that and forsake it. And, and uh, I want our people, the, the young people in our church, to remember our church as, as a church of people that weren't perfect, but we loved the Lord and we loved each other. And, and I don't know how much of that is on your radar as you walk in the doors, but it, it absolutely should be, because we're trying to build on, we're trying to give our children a, a strong foundation. But as we talked about last week, a foundation is good, but we should move on from that. We shouldn't just stay with the milk of the foundation, but we should move on to meat. And so the, he, the writer of Hebrews is telling his, the people that he's writing to, to, to build on the foundation that's been given them. Remember he said in verse uh, number 11 that he'd like to talk more about some of these deeper issues, specifically Melchizedek. Now we'll get to Melchizedek later on in this chapter. And I know some of you, you know, Rod, you're just licking your chops, like, let me have Melchizedek. Uh, but we'll have to wait to get there. But he's, he's telling them, before I can tell you all the great things, all the great pictures of the Old Testament that Christ fulfilled, I need you to understand that you have to be ready for this. And if you're not ready for this, it'll all go right over your head and you'll miss it. So it's important. Again, you can't build the second story of the house until you have... Foundation. The first story of the house. <laughs> well, the foundation, yes. But after that, you've got to build little by little. And so he's, we're going to talk about in Hebrews some second, third, fourth story stuff. And it's just important for you to say, all right, Lord, between you and I, I, I just, I'm committed to building on this foundation that you've given me. He wants them to move past what he calls in verse number 12 of chapter 5, first principles of the oracles of God. He wants them to move past not laying that foundation. So, and God wants you then to do the same thing, to not only shore up your foundation, we'll talk about your foundation and what that should be and how strong is your foundation. And then we'll talk about building the house on top of that. You know, when you're in, in education, you learn first of all how to read. And then as you grow older, you learn to read on your own and how to be a discerning reader. And, and you're always going to be a learner, but you have to get those fundamentals first. And so we're going to talk about fundamentals and then we'll talk about some of the other things that, that we should go on to. So let's look at chapter 5, verse 11, of whom we have many things to say and hard to be uttered, seeing you're dull of hearing. For when the time you ought to have be teachers, you have need that one teach you again that which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. 
For everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on to perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works, and of faith toward God, and of the doctrine of baptisms, and of laying on of hands, and of resurrection of the dead, and of eternal judgment. And this we will do if God permit. This we will do means we'll, we want to have this good foundation, but we want to build on that. We want to go further with this. So let's talk about this. How is your foundation? Notice he says, Let, therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ. Now, is he saying that the doctrines of Christ are not important? No. What he's saying is you've already learned the principles, the first things of the doctrine of Christ. So we're moving past that, not because it's not important, but because there are other things to learn. So what should we learn then? What should be a part of your foundation of how, what you know about Jesus Christ? You ought to know his personage. You ought to know that he, God, Jesus Christ is God in human flesh. He was with God from the beginning. He was not created. He was with God from the beginning. And he shared fellowship and glory with God. You ought to be familiar with some of those passages where Jesus talks about his relationship with God the Father and how it was not something that came about, but something that always was. And that he always enjoyed that relationship in perfection. Then he was incarnated or he came to earth to live among us. And as God never once sinned, we talk about that at the end of chapter 4, um, where he says, For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. So he is God in human flesh. He is the perfect image of God. He is the not only fully God, but he's also fully man. When we, we talk about this in Sunday school, but when we look at the world around us, we see just a lot of brokenness. We see mankind and we think, is this the best that it gets? Is this the way it was supposed to be? And the answer is no. This is not the way it was supposed to be. We were made in God's image and that means something. When we look at Jesus Christ, that is the picture of what we should have been. Jesus Christ and the life that he lived on the earth is the life that we should have been living in our in our in a new uh, in, in a pre-fallen world? Jesus Christ is the example of what it should have been. And I don't know about you when you read the gospel and you just see Christ's love and patience and his wisdom. I think to myself, man, wouldn't it be great if, if everybody was like that? And the answer is, yeah, that would be great. That'd be fantastic. And and that's what God's doing in me, and that's what he's doing in you as a Christian. He's he's turning you into that. Not just the old image, but the new image made new in Jesus Christ. He is the perfect example of the way to live. He showed God's power. And again, chapter 4, verse 15 says that because he experienced everything that we experience, he can identify with our suffering. He can identify with our trials. He is a good friend in that way. We also know about Jesus that he died and that he rose again. That he, in his death... Uh, got victory over sin and over death, and in his resurrection, uh, not only proclaimed God as righteous and himself as righteous, but then got us new life. And we'll talk about that tonight out of Colossians chapter 2, verses 12 and 13, where it talks about that us in Christ and what that means, that we were buried with him and rose again. But that's an important aspect of what it means. It's not just that Jesus died as a good example or as a martyr. Jesus did not die as a martyr. He died as a sacrifice. He died as an atonement. And that's an important, that's an important thing to understand as far as a foundational truth. Now again, this is what we build our, our faith on, this foundation of Christ, is not just things about Jesus, but it is Jesus. You understand? Like, you read the Gospels and you're like, oh, that's, that's, information about Jesus is the foundation of our faith. No. No. Information about, like, Ellen G. White or uh, Joseph uh, Smith, that's, that's the way they base their religion. The teachings of. Our religion, our faith is not so much based on the teachings of Jesus Christ. It is based on Jesus Christ. Amen. It is his person. You cannot have the Christian 
faith without Jesus Christ. Meaning this, it couldn't have been somebody else. It couldn't have been just Peter that was endued with wisdom and a fisherman who went about teaching and, and saying, blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs are the kingdom of God. No, nobody else, somebody else could have said those things, but nobody else could be Jesus. Right. He is the foundation of our faith. So it says in 1 Corinthians 3.11, other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Ephesians 2.20, we are built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. So that is the basis of everything. And if you don't really understand who Christ was and what he did for you, then your foundation is not very sure. If, you're, if your understanding of who Christ is, is is pretty shallow, then your faith will be shallow too. And when trials come, and which they inevitably will, your faith will crumble because you are, what Christ said, right, is that if you build on the foundation of Christ, then when the storms come, your house will stand firm. And if you build on the foundation of sand and your own understanding and philosophy and humanistic thinking, it will, when the storms come, collapse. So that's the foundation of foundations. That's the footings. But then we have, the, we have, or that's the bedrock. But then we have the footings. And he mentioned six different things. And I, I, I'll be real honest, I struggled with these this week. I, I have some great commentaries and I have some uh, you know, resources that help me. But a, a lot of commentators are just like, we're not really sure exactly what he's talking about here. And even then there's, the, there's this debate uh, Arthur Pink seems to say that this is all Jewish stuff that he's telling them to leave behind. And uh, a lot of commentators that I like otherwise um, say that they think it's Christian doctrine that he's telling them to build on. Andrew Murray was absolutely unhelpful. He's usually so helpful and he just kind of glossed right over this one. So anyway, what I'm going to say is, is maybe then just kind of my understanding of it and uh, you take it. As the Lord is leads and you leave whatever's not there, but I, I see at least that each of these six things are grouped into twos. So the first one has to do with salvation. And it says in verse number one, not laying again the foundation of, and he mentions two things, repentance from dead works and of faith toward God. That has to do with salvation. So what does the word repentance mean? The word repentance means literally to change your mind. Right, so here would be an illustration of this. Um, I'm going toward the organ. Here we go. And then I change my mind and say, no, I'd actually like to walk over toward the piano so that I change not only my mind, but I change my direction. And now I'm going toward the piano. That's what repentance means. It means I'm going one way and I change my mind and thus change my direction to go the other way. Now, what does that mean? So sometimes when you read in the Bible where it said God, God repented, it doesn't necessarily mean that God changed his mind, but it changed what he was going to do. Like God was going to bring wrath. They confessed their sins, so God repented, meaning he changed what he was going to do to them. And so when we repent, what does that mean for us? It means that when you come to Jesus Christ, when you first trusted Christ, you had to come to the point where you saw sin not as a good thing, but as a destructive bad thing that's going to get you in trouble with God. You had to come to the point where you're like, you know, someday I'm going to face a holy God. And if I still have my sins, that's not a good thing. Most of the world has a different category for sins. Oh, sure, we can talk about crimes and things that aren't very, you know... Uh, aesthetically pleasing, but they don't have a category necessarily for sins, meaning related to God. But there had to come a point in your life where you said, I am a sinner. I, If I don't take care of my sin, I'm in trouble and I can't look at sin as a good thing anymore. I have to change my mind and say, God, would you forgive me for my sins? God, would you take away my sins? I don't want them anymore. That's what repentance is. Now, that's when you came to Christ. But as you come to Christ, you also had to repent of what it says here, repentance from dead works. See, some of you, I have no doubt at all, weren't the worst sinners in the world before you got saved. You were pretty good people. Probably, and I, again, I've heard the testimony of some of you, you had the testimony that you were pretty religious. You had gone through the classes. You'd been to church. You'd taken communion, or you'd been baptized as a baby, and, and you were a pretty good person. And then, and then one day, somebody told you the gospel, and you heard that you're a sinner, and, and you had a choice to make. I'm going this way, 
and I'm, I'm a good person. And then you realize you're a sinner. And you had to decide, will I keep going in my dead works and say, I'll just try harder? Or am I going to repent and say, nothing in my hands I bring, simply to thy cross I cling. There had to come a point where you had to say, none of that stuff makes any difference. My baptism can't save me. My good works can't save me. My confirmation can't save me. Nothing that I can do can save me. You have to repent of your dead works, change your mind about how that can save you, and say, I believe Jesus Christ alone can save you. And if you have never come to that point, then you are not saved. You've never been born again. You have to come to the point where you say, the only, the only way I can be saved is by fully trusting in Jesus Christ on the cross, what he did for me. That's the only way that you can be saved. Now, faith is one side, or repentance is one side, and faith is the other side. Faith toward God. What is faith? Tr- faith is trusting in or believing in Christ. Now, when I talk to people out on the street or door knocking or whatever, and I say, have you ever, tr- have you ever, uh, you know, they say, well, I, I believe in Jesus, or I believe in God. And by that they mean, I believe that God exists, or I believe that Jesus was a good person, that he existed. They can even say that I believe that Jesus was the Son of God, or I believe that Jesus died for me. But that's not really, we're not really talking about a, a mental ascent. Like, I've never been to Togo, West Africa, but I believe that it's there, right? I believe, I believe the testimony of other people, but I'm not trusting in that. I, there, there are, I, I, I haven't seen my money in the bank, but I'm trust, but I'm believing that it's there. Not only believing it, but I write checks and use my debit card as if there is money there. I'm not only believing them, but I'm trusting them. And that's the big difference. It's not just believing about Jesus Christ, it's trusting in Jesus Christ. Again, uh, let me just, hold on. We'll grab this chair. So, I used to be where I thought I was a good person, I was going there, this direction, and I was resting in my own abilities as a good person to get me to heaven. There had to come a point where I looked at Christ, let's say this chair is Christ, and said, uh, do I believe that Jesus died not just for the sins of the world, but for me? Do I believe that he died for me? And some of you came to the point where you said, yeah, I believe that. But you, you believed it up here. You've never actually trusted. See, what do I have to do if I told you, yes, uh, yeah, Russ, I believe that this chair can hold me up. It's, it's made of metal and it's made of plastic. Of course I believe it. Yeah, I'd be a fool not to believe it. And Russ would say to me, well, why don't you sit in it then? Sit in it. I don't have to sit in it. I'm telling you, it's, it's trustworthy. Yes, but you're not resting in it. And that's the thing. For you, you have to come to the point where you don't just believe about Jesus, but you have to actually have to trust in him Amen. and rest in him. And that's the difference. That's saving faith. It's not just up here, it's, it's actual resting faith. And that's what we've been talking about in Hebrews a little bit, in Hebrews 4, that resting faith. But that, that faith is actual faith. And faith is the basis of our salvation. In Hebrews 10, verse 38, we'll get to that eventually, it says, Now the just shall live by faith, but if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. Listen, you come to Christ by faith, not by the works of your religion, not by your own goodness. It must be by faith. Now, faith itself doesn't save you, but faith plugs you into the grace that saves you. That's what Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9 say. Now, this is what happened in the past. This is what happened to you when you came to Christ. Now, let's look at the next two in verse number 2 of the doctrine of baptisms and of laying on of hands. This is having to do with, I believe, again, I believe... The church, the doctrine of baptisms, it's really, again, it's really hard to say exactly what the writer of Hebrews meant by this. The best, um, the best understanding, I think, is probably water baptism. And I'm not someone, tonight I'll talk about Colossians 2 and how I, I don't necessarily think that's talking about water baptism. But I think this is talking about baptism because it says baptisms. It's not the baptism of the Holy Spirit because that happens, I believe, once. It's not... Um, Uh, It's not your immersion into Christ. That happens, I think, once. So the plural here makes me think that this is talking about baptism, water baptism. So what does that mean? 
Well, there was this identification with Christ. When, when someone gets saved and after you're saved, we bring you up and we put you under the water and bring you up. That is an identification with Christ. I, you're telling everybody, I am a Christian. I'm a believer in Jesus Christ and I'm committing to walk in his ways. I'm committing to be a biblical Christian. And it, again, it's symbolic of what happened when you got saved. You went into Christ, into the grave with him. You were raised out of the grave. We'll talk about that again tonight and, and to walk in new life. It's symbolic. Now, I'm not saying that water baptism saves you. It does not. But what I'm saying is it's a picture of that. So the doctrine of baptism is, is, I think, maybe just that when you got saved, what you declared that you believed, all those things, that was a foundation for you. And then the other thing is laying on of hands. And again, it's hard to say exactly what that is. There were lots of different options. I think my best understanding is that this is talking about ordination. We read about that in 1 Timothy 4 during the scripture reading. 1 Timothy 4, 14, where he says... Uh, to Timothy, when the Presbytery laid their hands on you, they imparted a spiritual gift. And I believe that was the sending of Timothy to do the Lord's work. Um, it was referring to a sending out or a commissioning for the gospel. So this is not just the doctrine of baptisms or what you, what creed or what faith you said, I'm believing this, I'm going to walk in, with God after this, but also that sending to do that work. That commissioning, that that when the church came around those people and said, "We are in, we are committing to investing in this person," and again that refers to not what happened in the past, but what's happening in the present. And then we have at the end of verse two, and of resurrection of the dead and of eternal judgment. That has to do with the blessed hope. The resurrection of the dead refers to the resurrection body that all of those who trust Christ will one day receive, will live on the new earth in a new body, not subject to all the everything, <laughs> not subject to the sins of other people, not subject to decay like we have, not subject to a soul that always wants to sin against the spirit that's been made new in Christ, but a new resurrection body, a new existence. And then eternal judgment talks about the fact that we're going to stand before God someday. And, and those of us who are Christ will stand before the Lord and he will give reward for the things done in this life through the person of Jesus Christ. And those who do not know Christ, all none of their good works will be considered, only their sins. The Bible says the books will be opened and everyone will be judged out of those books. And for the great white throne, there is only condemnation. And for the judgment seat of Christ, there is only reward. And so eternal judgment, again, that's a basis of a foundation of what we believe. Now, it's interesting, and again, this is, I think, why some of the commentators had such a problem with this. If you were going to ask me what are the six essential doctrines, I probably wouldn't have named those six. <laughs> I would probably talk about God the Father, and what that's an essential doctrine. Uh, Christology, we already talked about. I would talk about the Holy Spirit. It's important for Christians to understand the person of the Holy Spirit, Amen. who He is. And I know that sometimes we in Baptist churches tend to just get away from that because of some of the teachings that are out there. But the Bible talks about the Holy Spirit as a wonderful gift, a comforter for us. We ought to know who the Holy Spirit is. We ought to have communion with the Holy Spirit. Uh, we ought to know about the Bible and what we believe about the Bible, what we believe about the church, what we believe about angels and demons and soteriology about salvation and hamartiology about sin. We ought to know a little bit about eschatology, about the end times. And, and so those things, again, uh, we'll talk about this in a little bit, but how strong is your foundation? How, how much have you delved into what you believe? How much have you dug into what you believe and started to firm those things up? And this is why it's important. In one of my commentaries, they quoted, um, well, I'll, I'll just read it here. Um, Richard Phillips says, evangelicals, and by evangelicals, he just means people that are not liberal, people that believe that, that we should be giving up the gospel. That's what evangelical means. Evangelicals hardly agree that the Bible is true, but they simply don't take the time to learn what it teaches. Recent surveys show that most professing Christians cannot, for instance, list half of the Ten Commandments cite the names of the four Gospels, or articulate what is meant by the term justification. They do not know who Abraham was or what Paul wrote in the book of Romans. Asked if the Bible says God helps those who help themselves, 80% 
of self-described evangelical Christians agreed. Actually, it was Ben Franklin. Pollster George Gallup summarizes the situation today, citing the glaring lack of knowledge about the Bible, basic faith with many people not knowing what they believe or why. No wonder, then, that the secular culture is unimpressed by teachings in which we ourselves are so disinterested. That's pretty damning. So how was your foundation? Now let's talk then, because it's not just about this foundation. He's about building on the foundation, not laying again these things. Okay? We don't, I'll talk about basic Christian things because it's important, but I want to move past that. If, if we just came into the church on Sunday morning and I said, Jesus loves you, this you know, for the Bible tells you so, and then we all went home, you, you wouldn't grow very much. Now, that's important. It's not untrue. It's just, can we move on? We talked about this last week. Can we move on? Can we have some meat? Can we start introducing some other things? Can, can you get some harder concepts to understand? Can you go a little deeper with that? And we'll talk about this. There's a little bit of a back and forth with this. But the foundation of Jesus Christ, let's talk about that. What else can be learned? I'm saying, Pastor, I know about Jesus Christ. I know what he did on the earth. I'm familiar with the Gospels. I, I know that he's the Son of God, so all those things are important. Let me ask you, um, um, what, about, what do you know about Christ's presence on the earth now? Did we say Easter two week, weekends ago that we serve a risen Savior, that we believe that Jesus rose from the dead? But then we don't actually, in practice sometimes, treat Jesus like he is alive and well and living in and through us. The presence of Jesus Christ wasn't just that he would be on this earth, go to heaven, and then come back someday. He is coming back someday, but bodily. He's alive in the world today. He said, when I go, I'll send the Holy Spirit. And he says, I will send the Comforter. And then he says, I will come to you. He wasn't talking about the second coming. He's talking about right now. Christ wants to live the Christian life, the life that he lived those four, those those 33 years. He wants to live that life in you now. He wants you to rely and surrender to him so that you can live, so that he can live his life in you right now. How much of that do you understand? I'll confess that that's been a fairly new concept for me. Over the last decade, I've had to learn that as a pastor. I didn't grow up believing that I needed to surrender. I believed in, here's your list of things a Christian does, now get to it in your own flesh, and that's exhausting, and that's hard. Then I say that surrendering to Christ is much easier. Saying, Christ, I cannot live the Christian life, but you can. I want to surrender every minute, every day, whatever, I mean, every hour, whatever it is, God, I want to know your presence in my life. I want you to live through me. And some of you are like, that's not a concept I'm very familiar with. That's how we can lay the foundation and move on from there. We can build on that foundation of Jesus Christ. How about Christ's ministry in heaven right now? How much do you know about that? Do you know that he intercedes for you? That he advocates for you? Do you know that the Holy Spirit prays for you? Do you know how to find those things? Do you know how to meditate on those things? Do you understand the way that God sees you? Your relationship with Jesus Christ? Have you studied his teachings to see what he says about us? Jesus Christ as the perfect image of God, uh, as he talks about man, God, the kingdom of God, we learn a lot about ourselves and a lot about what God expects from us. So let's talk about the area of salvation. We talked about repentance, but repentance wasn't a one-time thing. Repentance is an ongoing thing. You need to keep confessing your sins. I praise God, when you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive you your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. But there is this continual repentance. How much do you understand about Satan's attacks? Like when you're attacked, do you have the, do you have the, the understanding in the spirit of what's really going on? See, immature Christians will, when they're attacked by Satan, start blaming everybody else, you know, or start, or somehow justify themselves. And people who have learned repentance, and I am a, and how, how can Paul say that he's the chief of sinners? How can he say that he's less than the least of the apostles? Well, I don't know exactly, but I know that he understands sin on a different plane than I do. And I want to get to the point where I understand how deep my sin is and how, deep, how much deeper the grace of God is to purge that out of me. 
That comes through confession and repentance. That's important. What about faith? Um, learning to, again, further surrender, further dependence upon him. That, that chair was not a once and done. Yep, I trust in Christ. No, it is an every day. Learn about what the gospel is. Find your identity in who God says you are as a new person, not in the, con not in the identity that you've constructed for yourself, because that is a hard way to live. The identity that you've constructed for yourself. Um, in Christ, however, if you understand what God says about you, that, again, is not just, it's not just a foundation. It is a first floor that will open up all kinds of new avenues for you to live in the Lord. Again, I've lived in the flesh. I've lived the Christian life in the flesh, and it is exhausting. And I still do it sometimes. I'm not saying I'm perfect at this. I'm just saying, like, now that I know it doesn't have to be this way, that is so freeing. The day that I understand, I don't have, this doesn't have to be like this all the time. It doesn't have to be the struggle of grinding it out. It doesn't have to be that way. You can just be surrendered to Christ and let him live through you. That life of faith is so much more fulfilling and freeing. And if you say, I don't really understand that, then I'm urging you to build on that foundation and move past that. What about the church? There's no perfect church. Now, I love this church. Um, this this church, I, I'm not going to... I just love... Listen, I don't consider myself as an employee of the church or as the head of the church. I'm a member of the church. And I love being a member of this church. Amen. If the Lord called another person to be the pastor, I'd like to think that I could still be a member of this church. It would be awkward, I'm sure. But I, I love this. If I, could, if I had to leave, I want to find a church like this one because I just love this church. But it's not a perfect church. You know that. I know that, right? And what are we trying to do? We're trying to be like, all right, well, then what are the areas of, of our church that we need to make better, that we need to that we need to understand better in some way. Uh, so when we talk about the doctrine of baptisms, all right, we all said when we got baptized, yes, I'm going to live for Christ. What does that look like? What does that mean? How are we holding each other accountable to that confession of faith? When we talk about laying on of hands, what, what should missions look like? Are we doing it the right way? Are, are we, do we really be saying we have a heart for missions? Do we really? Or are we just content to put a, uh, something in the plate and, and pray for people? That's wonderful. I'm just saying that's kind of foundational stuff. There's a lot of other missional stuff. There's a lot of other things that we ought to be doing in our own community for missions. And we ought to grow in that and not be content with laying the foundation of, well, yeah, I understand missions. Okay. Can we be doing it better? Can we be doing it more fervently? Is there anything that we can do to grow in that area? And I think there is, because we're not a perfect church, because we are growing in our understanding of what, who the Lord is and what he wants for us. Talking about the blessed hope. What does the Bible teach about what's coming in the future? You know, talking about the resurrection. How much does the resurrection of Christ and, and that final resurrection uh, with, with us in him, how much bearing does that have on my life today? How much, uh, as I'm looking for the returning of the Lord Jesus Christ, how much of that actually filters down into my life? Like, if, if I always, if an angel from God, now again, this, the Bible says, if an angel of God comes and says this, so we'd be probably all skeptical. But it's, if some way the Lord communicated to all 60 of us at once, I'm coming May 8th. You have one week. Mother's Day, Jesus is coming back. Rapture, okay? If we knew that, we had 168 hours. How would we live our life this week? That would make a difference, right? And the more you understand, Christ is coming back. We don't know when. I'm not setting a date. I'm only saying, if you have that at the forefront of your mind. I was talking with Jeff about this this week. And just the idea that the Bible says, redeeming the time because the days are evil. You know what that means? It means we're short on time. It means you think you have years and decades. I'm not talking about America. I'm not, I'm not talking about you. I'm, I'm just talking about we do not know how much time we have. What time are you using for the Lord? See, the more you understand the coming of the Lord, the more you understand it's imminent, the more you understand that, man, things are really going bad in the world, and it could get really bad. I'm not talking about what should you need to, uh, well, I should learn Taekwondo and Karate so I can defend myself when they take all my guns. No, that's the wrong application. <laughs> what manner of men should we live? Well, how should we live a godly life knowing I have just a few short years with my neighbors before I can't tell them about the gospel anymore? 
I got people that I see on a regular basis. How much more fervent would I be if I really thought my time is short? See, that's a foundation. We're building on that foundation. What about judgment? What will God ask of me when I stand before him? So I think so many times we just forget that we're going to stand before God. And because we believe that Jesus forgave all of our sins, we think that's all that it's about. We get to heaven, and God's going to say, I find you innocent, enter in, into the joy of the Lord. Yes, that's great. That's wonderful. I'm looking forward to that. There's also a time when the Bible says, I will give an account for my life. I'm going to have to talk about May 1st, 2022, what I did. Josh, did you preach that message in your flesh or relying on me? Terry, when you were listening to that message, did you respond in the way that I was urging you to? Did you allow yourself, Dave, to get distracted during the message? I'm not trying to pick on anyone. I'm just trying to say, <laughs> you're going to stand before the Lord, and he's going to ask you, I invested in you. I gave my blood for you. And, and what did I get from that? What did you do with what I gave you? And I believe we're going to stand before God someday. Now, again, I, not for condemnation. But I, I don't know about you, I want to be able to give the Lord something that in my life, that, Lord, you bought me with your precious blood. Amen. I was five years old when you bought me, and Lord, for a long time I floundered. But when I got it, Lord, I, I tried the best I could to let you live through me. And Lord, the life that you purchased with your blood here is what I have to give back to you. You are worthy of my life. You are worthy of what I did. That day is coming. And the more you understand that you're going to stand before God, and, and, and the less you can say to yourself, I'm, I'm sure it'll be fine. As long as I'm in heaven, I don't care. On that day, you will care. Yeah. That's right. On that day, you'll wish you had this day back. Yeah. And, and the, again, it's just that's the foundation. We're building on the foundation of judgment. It's not enough for me just to say, oh, It'll be great to be in heaven someday. It will, absolutely. There are just other things that come before that. And you need, not, you need to understand that. We ought to know and understand and live as much as we can. Now again, bear with me just a minute. Um, there are majors and there are minors. And do you know that Satan is always trying to get us off on one side or another? I was, I was, uh, I don't generally listen to Christian radio. You say, you're a pastor, you don't listen to Christian radio? I don't, I listen to, I listen to NPR. I listen to classical music. Uh, <laughs> but I was on a Christian station and there was this lady, and uh, since she's on the radio, I can out her, right? Uh, Janet and Markel, now if you, in, or Jane, Jane Markel, okay? Uh, and if you enjoy her and I'm, I'm blowing her up, I apologize, but, what she was saying was, listen, churches are not preaching uh, pre-trib rapture, and I'm a, I believe in pre-trib rapture, but they're like, churches are not preaching it every week, and only 2% of churches are even talking about the end times, and if you're not in a church that's talking about this, then you should, you should find one that is. And can I tell you how many people I've met that should be in a church like ours? They believe the Bible, they believe a lot of things like you do, because they don't talk about the rapture every single week, they don't want to be here. Right? Because you have all these things. Because like Satan makes this the thing. There are people that are left our church because I don't say that only Paul's preaching, only Paul's letters are for today. Like, like I believe that we should take the whole counsel of God. That it's all inspired by God. And yeah. so there are people that aren't part of our church because of little things like that. And, and Satan can take the minors and make them the biggest thing where it's like those people aren't even in church right now. The people that have been a part of our church, and like, we really think that you should be worshiping on Saturday and not Sunday. So they're not doing anything. Right? Like, do you understand? But then you have other churches where they're like, these big doctrines, not important. Huh? Jesus was a good person. He may have sinned. Maybe not. It's not that big of a deal. The big deal is God is love. Okay, do I believe God is love? Yeah, absolutely. Should we preach it? Absolutely. But... See, there's this, there's this skewing. There, there's this, and we have to get to the point where we understand what is the most important thing. What does God want from me? And God wants me to grow in Him. And so, again, Satan is old. What I'm trying to do in this church is hold up things that have been preached for the last two thousand years. Amen. You said that's boring. 
No, it's not boring. You know the exciting part of I want to learn this. I want to learn that I want to learn what salvation is. I want to learn who the Holy Spirit is. I want to learn what Christ is doing today. That's not boring. Right. I don't understand that fully. The more I understand, the more exciting it gets. And the really exciting part then for us is to say, okay, now how do we live that out in the 21st century America? Because the way they were living in the first century, the way Christians were, the way Augustine was living it in the fifth century, the way that um, uh, believers in the 12th century were living it is way different than the way we're living it. So let's have a conversation about how to live for the Lord and, and what that should look like. But let's not get rid of old doctrine because if, if it's... If it's new, it's probably not true. And if it's true, it's probably not new. We should delve into this as much as we can and get to know it. And um, so again, Satan is always trying to get us off on one side or another. He tells us some things don't matter much. You know, open theism, believing that God doesn't know the future. He's making really good guesses, but he doesn't actually know the future. Uh, like a lot of churches have done, come to accept homosexuality as an alternate lifestyle instead of sin. I can love sinners, but can't accept sin, right? Uh, he tells us that, that little things are big, right? That we ought to run away from those who don't, like for instance, uh, which, which is it? Should we have a board of elders or one pastor? Well, that's a little thing. Sure, good people can differ on some of those things. Uh, is the Spirit, Holy Spirit's filling, is that a one-time thing or is it a continual thing? Well, good Christians can differ on those things. Uh, could Jesus have sinned? Now, I'm not saying he did, but could Jesus have sinned? Or was it possible for him to sin and he didn't? Or it wasn't possible for him to sin and he didn't? Those are things that people, he never sinned, but those are things that people can differ on. Uh, which, is, which is the better attribute of God, the, the highest attribute of God, holiness or love? Right? Th those are things that are good to talk about and, 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 and uh, uh, wrangle with and, and as we get into Scripture, but what happens to the tribulation saints? We don't know. There's a lot of things that we don't know. Uh, can the devil read our thoughts? Uh, again, these are questions that, that listen, there's a lot in here. There's a lot in here that we have to get. There's a lot in here that we just don't even understand that's going to make a difference in our life. It's going to change the way we are. And uh, not laying again the foundation, but building on that foundation. Not going off and building this treehouse somewhere else because it's a fun little hobby horse. And not just staying on the pavement, right? Building and growing on that. You have to learn to be discerning and to care about what God cares about. Can I just then give you a few things uh, and I'm done. Uh, one is, how, so how do I grow in that way? Well, one is, just we, I, so I preach, I don't know how many of you know this, I preach five times a week. I have the radio broadcast. I just got done with First Thessalonians. Um, I have Sunday school. We're doing, we're going through uh, the study of sin right now. Preaching, of course, Sunday morning. You know about that one already, Hebrews chapter six. Uh, and he, the book of Hebrews. Um, Sunday night, we're going through Colossians. Wednesday night, we're going through Psalms. I also do a Luke Bible study. I did, I just finished up a Romans Bible study. Um, so there are all kinds of opportunities for you to grow. I want to invest in you. I want you to grow. I'd like you to be here for as much as you can to grow. If you feel like you're an anemic Christian, maybe the Lord would have you to join some of our other services to learn to grow in the Lord. I'm not saying this from a legalistic standpoint. I'm not saying you're a horrible person if you miss. I'm only saying if you want to grow, if you've got a good foundation and you want to go up, there are opportunities for that. If you want, if you say, I, I, I feel like I do need to just kind of shore up those, those, those things, those foundations. Uh, a few months ago, our church on Sunday nights went through this program where I taught everybody who was here how to be, how to disciple other people. And this is just this is a curriculum that's real easy for teachers to use and just really, I mean, basic stuff. This is milk. But then there's like three other books that talk about some of the other things. And if you say, you know, I would really love to have some Bible study in that area. I would love to even just be thinking about these things to be challenged in some way. Pastor, do you think that you could meet with me? There's a good chance that I can't. But we have people in our church that could. Amen. And maybe I could. But I'm just saying, like, it, it's, up, it's up to you, right? This is just like, here, are you interested in growing 
in the Lord and having some fellowship with some other believers that could help you grow in the Lord where you could be discipled. You could allow a, a mature Christian invest in you. And that mature doesn't mean an old person who's older than you. It just means someone who can maybe help answer your questions a little bit. And, and could you spend some time in, uh, in Bella Cafe drinking coffee and talking about the Word of God with somebody who can provide some of the answers. Listen, that you have a good foundation, and that's great. Maybe your foundation's a little shaky, but let's do something about that. Let's shore up that foundation. Let's start to build on it. And however, however we as a church can help, that's what we want to do. Um, but there comes a point where you're the one that has to say, that's what I want. I'm, I'm, I'm going to take this seriously. I'm going to walk with the Lord in this way. God, help us as we try to 